on the road. Tonight's Evolution Hour, or tomorrow morning, or whenever time zone you are in, on whatever part of the planet you may be on, or some later point, a thousand, a million years, or some ancient civilization discovers that some old fart back in the 21st century was doing uh, videos. Remember, the WordPress.com um, has a bunch of freebie stuff, um, older, but still great deal of stuff on um, macro-evolutionary episodes and uh, a bunch of stuff. So anyway... There is our opening little uh, bit. Um, and we'll find out whether or not we are getting comments from the live chat, which at least is kind of showing as a, a blip here, here at the moment, although we don't. Let me give a little time here to see if it's active. Hi, all. And there we go. Okay. So at least our uh, live chat is uh, operational for anybody who are still up in the wee hours of the morning or whatever time zones you're in uh, on this. Um, as you know, we are going through the dear creation of Titans, and at last, at last, at last, we are starting to get into the tax section on theropods, which is going to be a really, really fun thing. Um, there won't be much in the way of the technical citations yet, because an uh, element of this uh, has come up um, ahead of that in terms of its structure, and it relates to where Sarfati and Tay started off um, right on the bat. Oh, let me also put up my... Patrons, to remind everybody that I am well aware of the fact that there are people out there who have been instrumental in keeping the project going, our colleagues and researchers and assistant researchers and friends and legacy patrons who have come and gone over the years uh, as the economy has flipped up and down and in and out and over and under and around and through. So I am entirely grateful to everyone who's continued to help over all of this time. Uh, I couldn't be doing it without you. And needless to say, if a million more people would like to become patrons to the project, I won't object. Anyhow, let us get to the wherewithal of things. Um, Sarfati and they, they start out their thought chapter uh, with a bang or a fizzle, depending on your point of view, because they insist, quote, a majority seem to have been mainly vegetarian, at which point my mammalian jaw has dropped in thinking, what? That most of the dinosaurs were vegetarians. This, of course, fits into the creation of dogma that um, uh, carnivory only came about after Adam sinning and whether or not this was after the flood or not is a thing that is churned around in creationist apologetics for the last 40 or 50 years. We'll be alluding to all of that, of course, in volume two over there. Uh, but what was their source for this assertion about most uh, theropods being um, mainly vegetarian? Well, that turns out to come from a paper which is listed as Sarfati and Cosner or Sarfati and Sanders, depending upon which version of it you're looking at, because I think um, uh, Lita uh, Sanders was formerly uh, Lita Cosner. That was her maiden name. And so they've altered the text because there's two versions of it, one at creation.com and another one, I think, in Answers in Genesis. All complicated mess. At any rate, um, this little puppy turned out to some interesting little components uh, on it. It's referring to um, a couple of technical papers by Zano, of which the main one in 2011 uh, from PNAS for your perusal, because that's the meat of the thing, and also a secondary uh, coverage from 2010 uh, by this fellow Bloxham at the Telegraph, not exactly the most reliable of sources, because it was really going on. Its, its main title was, most dinosaurs were vegetarian, research suggests. So this was a misrepresentation of the internal material offers. And was Sarfati really good at noticing all of this? Um, hard to tell. Uh, at any rate, uh, the Zano paper uh, was not at any point maintaining that most theropods uh, were um, uh, not carnivores. Uh, in fact, dinosaurs and others definitely listed as carnivores in that Zano 11 paper. Uh, in they're also including the avian bunch in the dinosaur grouping in their analysis, which, of course, is verboten uh, from the creationist point of view. Um, it's interesting that Robert Carter, bless his soul, uh, 
blundered in exactly the same way that Sarfati did, relying on the same Sarfati and Cosner slash Sanders, by the way, um, uh, when he was uh, on involved with the CMI lecture. And uh, we're going to be alluding to that there, volume two, because um, uh, Dapper Dino did a nice little analysis on it, which he even also noticed that uh, Carter misspelled Tyrannosaurus Rex in one of his slides that he was presenting. Anyway, um, in no sense whatsoever can it be argued that most of the theropods are uh, carnivores. And ironically, bless the little heart, the reason why I didn't jump right into the technical literature that's going to be presented through this chapter, and it's about a page or so of technical citations that they're dealing with for uh, the whole chapter, is that I realized I needed to now analyze first what their breakdown was of how many taxa they were discussing and how many kinds they were, because they do, in fact, identify kinds, kind of, sort of. Um, it turns out, of the theropod group, they're only listing 15 taxa in, the, in this analysis that they have. Uh, uh, Acanthosaurus, uh, which uh, is a big one that you would, uh, the, its little tracks are uh, the ones that are showing up at the Paluxy River, by the way. And I'm not sure whether they're actually going to be alluding to that in the main thing, because I said I haven't gone through uh, their, their detailed text. I was looking for a different issue, which was how are they listed by diet and what kinds are they? Um, Allosaurus was another, Baryonyx, um, uh, Carcharodontosaurus, Carnotaurus, uh, Cebophysis, Compsignathus, uh, Convenator, Deinonychus, Dilophosaurus, Spinosaurus, uh, Therizinosaurus, um, which is going to be the oddball of the group, Tyrannosaurus rex, Utah raptor, and Velociraptor. Not exactly a gobsmackingly impressive array of ones, given how many dinosaur taxa there are. But anyway, how many kinds are involved? Well, it turns out they have 10 or maybe 9, depending upon how they're lumping the stuff. Because they can't quite make up their mind about these allosaurids and the carcontodontosaurids and others where they're wondering whether or not maybe they're part of a larger grouping or not. Um, that, um, and then I decided I would be checking back because uh, the Ark Encounter also has a listing of all the kinds aboard the Ark. How does their listing fit up? Are all of the kinds that are listed in Sarfati and Tay's little short account, which presumably they're deeming to be comprehensive, um, their nine uh, or ten uh, kinds, um, are all of them on the Ark Encounter list? Well, it turns out all but one, because the Spinosaurids are not on the Ark list. That's those great finback uh, forms of which uh, the Baryonyx and that is uh, connected up into that group. So uh, it's possible when I look in a little bit more detail, maybe they're listing them as Baryonyx uh, format uh, ones uh, rather than Spinosaurids per se. So maybe they're giving them a different name. Uh, we'll be looking into that little detail. Um, but what about this herbal carnivore issue? Well, going by their own listing of the kinds that are involved, They've got 14 taxa that are carnivores and one, the therizinosaurs, as a herbivore, which means 93% of their own list is carnivorous. How the hell could they, with a straight face, think that most of the theropods were uh, herbivorous when by their own presentation, they're not presenting that? Something isn't matching up right quite right. And it also is a reminder how superficial Robert Carter is, whether or not he's rowing his little boat out in the in the uh, lake or uh, lecturing in front of a creationist audience, that he's relying way too heavily on the secondary spin of Sarfati and company for a lot of his presentations, uh, because he can't possibly have looked in detail into the original Zano paper. Otherwise, he would know that argument wasn't washing. And yet he was presenting this secondary redaction stuff. Um, with a straight face to their creationist audience who presumably won't be fact-checking any of it later. Um, so this is lobbing us off to a very poor start. Uh, there's apparently four main sections of the work. There's going to be a section on the sauropods, which it sounded like there's only two kinds that, uh, from what I can see so far. And then they're breaking down the armored dinosaurs, which would be like ankylosaurs and, and uh, uh, 
ceratopsids and all that bunch. And then the uh, um, uh, conventional um, uh, iguanodins and uh, duckbill dinosaurs, you know, hadrosaurs and all that bunch. Uh, there's a whole bunch more dinosaurs that are connecting up in this mix uh, that they may just be leaving out completely. We'll find out as we plow through it page by page by page. Uh, so the next segments uh, that we'll be dealing with in the weeks to come, will be going through the technical literature that they are citing or dribbling for the documentation rel relative to the uh, dinosaurs that they're bringing up. Um, the material that it looks like, it's a very non-controversial breakdown because they're basically accepting dinosaur carnivory uh, right and left. Um, but the issues will be what information is in the papers that they are deciding to wave in front of their readers in their notes that actually will be undermining the creationist argument if you start looking too closely. So I'm going to be examining what kind of data suppression. And of course, then the obvious factor is none of the material that they're going to be presenting on dinosaurs uh, from the paleontological direction is being done by creationists. Uh, th th as far as I know, none of them, Kurt Wise and others who do actually have paleontology degrees, none of them are doing field work in this area. So the actual paleontology preparation and analysis and ain't coming from any other stuff. So that's going to be kind of a fun little thing to, that we'll be uh, uh, dealing with. Uh, part two is a, a little bit of a sidebar because it relates to our speciation issue and it relates to the origin of cetaceans. Uh, this one is not one that um, uh, is related to a particular creationist spin, although it wouldn't be at all surprising that some creationists are going to be dealing with it in some course. But it was just some Twitter chatter, or should I say X? Nah, it's still Twitter. Um, on a, uh, had brought to my attention a very neat paper on an apparent recent speciation um, in finless porpoises. That's a 2008 paper by Wang. I'll be putting the link up to that. That's open access. And then looking more into that, because 2008 is quite a while ago, uh, 2018, uh, another nature paper that I'll be putting links to, uh, on incipient speciation in some freshwater porpoises in China. Now, all of this is all relevant to the whole topic of cetaceous ev cetacean evolution and also um, it, the spread of, of cetaceans in a saltwater environment and their penetration into freshwater and all of that kind of stuff. So all of that's going to be a, a, a meaty little subject matter that's going to be in volume two of the rocks right there. Um, I am not seeing anyone in our uh, chat overlay at the moment, so it's very possible that we are alone in the world. Um, the, the new book will have a very extensive breakdown of the Ark Encountered Kind list, which this will be functionally the first time anyone has pulled all of this material together. I give a little hat off to um, uh, Erica for getting um, her version of the um, listing uh, available for us scholars to deal with. And then I have another um, photograph that I was able to cross check on things to figure out what was going on because Answers in Genesis does not go out of their way to tell you how many kinds are on their damn list, even though they got a list. And yet they've made no attempt whatsoever to offer this material up for people to see. And more importantly, the documentation for why they picked the critters and in what order. Um, the Sarfati and Tay book, at least, operates off of an alphabetical listing. Acrocanthosaurus to Velociraptor, blah, 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 perfectly fine. Um, but the Ark Encounter is not running off of that. Also, the issue will be when I'm done to see just how many of the potential dinosaur kinds are not on their scope for the CMI audience versus how many of them have gotten lost in the shuffle at the Answers in Genesis end of it for the Ark Encounter. And then in addition to which the just uh, issues about why particular kinds are being discussed, why uh, a particular family is being treated as the dynamic involved and so forth. It's uh, there's a lot of little material goes on and the devil is in the details. And uh, uh, hopefully we will have a delightful scoop in being the very first off the mark with some detailed analysis of this that anybody that will be having the book will have nice, neat breakdown charts to follow through uh, that they can use frankly, in any discussion of how many kinds there are, because I don't think anybody in the creationist community is going to be able to whittle down the number of kinds below that of what you can see at the Ark Encounter, because uh, they would have to be uh, 
bumping it up well above the family level uh, stage. And if they're doing that, they're accepting more and more and more evolution within a kind. And even though, um, uh, ironically, Mr. Sanders, um, who has been popping up as one of the AIG uh, jihad pundits complaining about the uh, evolutionary creationism backsliders like uh, Todd Wood and the like, um, that um, they're really never going to be able to step around this issue of either they've got to, to keep the list of the kinds down manageably, they're going to have to accept a level of speciation and a rate of speciation and a rate of morphological change that exceeds the load limit for our little niche, which is within the hominids. And how can you keep Australopithecines, especially if you start really paying close attention to that little squishy zone um, as you move into uh, uh, the Homo habilis era uh, and then move on farther down the road? Uh, and at the same time, how can they justify, which they most creationists tend to want to drag Neanderthals into the human species, even though that was a, a theoretically tenable argument to offer 50 years ago. Uh, but now that we have actual DNA from Neanderthals and we have so many bones that we can see the ontogeny of children and the tooth eruption patterns and the skull morphing patterns and that, that are falling way outside the human range, that they've got things that are just, they're distant cousins. Not as distant as the Australopithecines, but more distant than uh, um, are um, ones that are in um, the out of Africa superstructure of about 300,000 years ago. So this is um, um, an issue that relates to the human evolution story and will be brought up in that element. Uh, the Ark Encounter avoids the issue uh, systematically by leaving the hominids out of the picture. Um, of their Ark Encounter, even though, I guess, what are they thinking that they had just, what apes are brought aboard? Uh, there's a, a confusion that's going on in the creationist community today, and you can see it across ICR to uh, AIG to CMI and the Ark Encounter and all that, as to when apes developed. So there are little niches of young earth creationists who are arguing that there was an original, but well, that, that, Maybe um, apes developed out of us as some degenerate thing that happened after uh, Babel or after the uh, people got off the ark. Um, it, there's a, a, a utter confusion on this point, which is an understandable problem that it was inevitable for them to get into because of the fact that when you start applying the standards, hello, command cyborg. Yeah, um, I've just been... Um, uh, regaling our audience um, up in the world at large about the meat of the thing as our Sarfatian table book is finally starting to dive into the actual taxa. And the upshot is that they can't quite make up their mind on a third of their own taxa that they're bringing up on theropods as to what kind they are. They, there's an argument that they want to kind of lump maybe some of them together or not. Uh, and what criteria are they using? They don't explain. But the fact that there's head scratching at all and ambiguity in this area is owing to the fact that you've got these pile up of lots and lots and lots of, of uh, teeter-totter balancing act theropods, uh, which when you look at it from standard systematic with cladistic tools, uh, are sufficiently distinct that you've got different families involved. But the lines start blurring as you start going back and back into time. And uh, I noticed that in their book, they avoid discussing Herrerasaurs. Uh, and the uh, even though they're aware of the papers that were talking about the systematic ambiguities of the various kinds, uh, the, the, the Sorician versus Ornithischian uh, block and all of that. So they were alluding to that, but not diving into the reason why there was that uh, classification issue, not that theropods and sauropods don't group together quite nicely and continue to do so in modern systematics, independent of whether or not one group is seen as closer to the other based upon how they're analyzing this horarosaur and earlier um, uh, data. Because the early dinosaurs are very hard to tell apart. And for that matter, I would suspect that an awful lot of creationists, if you were to put up a slide of the Ligasuchids and you know, the rabbit croc um, bunch, 
that aren't in the dinosaur grouping at all, but look very similar to them, that you would need to get detailed diagnostics to realize that you're talking about two similar but not quite identical groups that are actually on separate lineages. And since none of these things get close enough to be able to detail any of the little fine tuning on it, um, they're not getting into that. Um, so first of all, virtually nobody in the creationist field is an active dinosaur paleontologist. And there are very few paleontologists at all, and they aren't typically active in the field either. They're doing things within the creationist niche. You've got a small bunch of people that pop up um, at, from Loma Linda University, typically, the uh, Seventh-day Adventist bunch that still does active paleontology. Uh, areas. They were digging up some whales down in, um, uh, whale fossils down in Peru a few years back, and I'm not entirely sure they've gotten around to actually publishing some of their stuff on it. Um, and and they, so they, they're circuiting that drain, but an awful lot of them are not actually paleontologists. They're from the geologist side of things and so forth. But the ones that, that definitely have a paleontology degree, um, uh, Todd Wood and um, uh, Marcus Ross uh, and that, um, or I mean, Kurt Wise and Marcus Ross, um, where, what, what work are they doing? No creationist university is underwriting these things. They don't have paleontology departments at these places. So they're doing basically apologetic arguments. And some of them, of course, the uh, wise is involved with the baromenologists that are trying to sort through the data that they did not collect uh, that was generated by the regular paleontologists and shoving it into their little formulas to try to find the designations between the kinds. Well, we haven't seen a hell of a lot yet on the dinosaurs. And uh, I'm sure the necessity to resolve the issue will force them into doing something more and more over time. But the difficulty will be that they'll have an ever expanding pile up of um, technical literature that they'll have to step over. And if they're stepping it over it as gingerly as Sarfati and Tay are doing the Zano paper on the, on the implication of uh, uh, herbivory within certain lineages of um, the niche groups of the theropods, including the therizinosaurs, uh, then holy moly, um, they're going to be behind the curve constantly. And they'll be able to come up with pretty good-looking pictures, and there'll be nice stuff that, that, that has about the level of detail that you would expect from a kid's book. But if you compare Sarfati and Tay with um, even a very old dinosaur encyclopedia, David Norman's stuff that he was doing that really got me hooked on dinosaurs back in the mid-1980s, um, that the level of meticulous cross-referencing and detailing um, is vastly larger. Smaller typeface, for one thing, so there's more information on the page. So the books that are seemingly about the same number of pages, you're getting way more material in a David Norman dinosaur encyclopedia uh, from 30 years ago than you are from this 2022 book. Uh, relatively large typeface, so everything is, is much lighter and, and uh, um, to give it the impression that there's more there than there actually is. So uh, this will be, a, a, I think, an excellent um, <coughs> measuring stick to look at CMI's view of baromenology uh, and the Answers in Genesis master listing that they have for the Ark Encounter. And how many of them think that they're also going to be having in this book a section on the marine reptiles and pterosaurs. So we'll find out how in due course how many little critters are ending up on their scope in that respect. Uh, because um, Answers in Genesis is in the opposite mode. They're trying to avoid marine critters altogether. So leaving out ichthyosaurs and all that bunch uh, in addition to all the other ones because they presumably no problem. They can just swim around and do what they like and somehow or other never end up in the same strata as some uh, um, pushy little uh, porpoise. Um why that would be the case, no creationist is ever going to figure out because there's no way they're going to be able to have this stuff sorting so exquisitely specialized. In addition to the whole issue of, of how does the land convulse and form the forms that we have today with all the little sidebar details. Um, they can get away with explaining flood deposits that are on floodplains, um, estuaries, things like that. They tend to shy away or misrepresent material that's relating to um, anoxic lakes, which is a common feature in Lagerstätten deposits, 
and the little words that we discussed in the first book, Plattenkalks, which is um, relating to, I'll put that in a little live chat here. It's a funky little word. Um, I may have mentioned it before. I am definitely going to do it. I think this is the spelling. It's a German word, uh, as uh, a lot of these terminologies are. Anyway, uh, an example, the famous example of a Plattenkalk is the Solnhofen, um, where Archaeopteryx comes from. And by the way, all fossil Archaeopteryxes are known only from the Solnhofen. Uh, Comsognathus, which is, uh, uh, I think, the one that's um, uh, also found in there, uh, there's only one fossil of a Comsognathus outside of the Solnhofen. So you, you have these very narrow little windows. But the point is that a platencalk is a deposit that's formed gently. The kinds of little silt and stuff that's forming can't form in a catastrophic circumstance. It can't form even in a little tidal estuary. It's got to be really dead water that's just gently it's filtering down without oxygen so you don't have a lot of bacterial decay and all that. And it's no coincidence then that, that you find these platencalks showing up um, as the distinctive features of Lagers Dayton, including the Solenhofen. So if you check out that little terminology, um, you can pretty well peg the kinds of paleontological deposits that are going to be avoided generally by the creationists because they would have to try to explain why the hell there's a platencalk there to begin with since it can't form in a catastrophic flood. Oops. Uh, similarly, sand dunes, um, aeolian deposits. That was another one. That, there's a buzzword that you can fiddle with. Uh, that's... Um, um, Creationists are forced by the structure of the big slosh to deny entirely that there are any uh, aeolian sand dune desert deposits anywhere in the fossil record, even though it's possible to identify them in terms of things. And you would have the, the, the absence of, for example, marine foraminifera uh, that you would find in the context of underwater uh, sea dunes that you can form somewhat similar shapes, but the angles that you can get underwater are different than the kinds of things that are typical for um, up in like Mongolia and that the famous examples of, of um, uh, the Aeolian deposits there, but they pop up all through the fossil record. Typically they're relatively small little niche zones uh, that are within a larger landscape of preservation. And that's also something which is um, screaming about the implausibility of the um, sorting mechanisms and the, the, the interconnections of stuff. How can you have these little micro landscapes if we're not talking about actual micro landscapes? Um, and, uh, the same thing when we, uh, when Colton was, uh, showing me on our little brief tour that we did down the uh, trails, finally, uh, at the Grand Canyon, we went down yeah, a good chunk of the ways and it was kind of icky weather and there was ice and stuff. So we were very careful about what we were doing on it. But he could point out, because he's a geology student, literally little these little arc-shaped things that look like little smiley faces on the strata that are the indications of little streamlets that have now been cut through by the canyon. But at when the time that they were originally laid down would have been little river drainage systems that were coming off, going into the large part of when there was no canyon there. Um, all of that stuff is utterly inexplicable to figure out how that could be forming in a catastrophic flood deposit. And therefore, there's always a level of limitation to any of their discussions that's where how far can they press beyond the cartoon level and start really getting serious about individual depositional frames. And so you find that um, the cartoon format that you see in uh, the Grand Canyon Monument to uh, uh, Cataclysm catastrophe that um, Steve Austin did back in the 80s, 90s, somewhere in there. I have a copy of the bloody thing. Um, that uh, it's very, very superficial. And frankly, oh, I'm in asynchronous mode, zooming through the beginning of the stream, I'll be in sync with live 15 or 17, if it's still live by then. Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, yes, yes, and you can, you can always uh, theoretically speed me up, you know, mode and uh, listen to it at higher speed to um, uh, get in there. Oh, hello, Purple. Yes, there we go. Um, it's going to be a fun little show uh, in terms of plugging all, relating all this information to the answers in Genesis listing. Because the one thing that Jackson and I have had some of our most amusing times with are when we're comparing one block of creationists with another block of creationists on issues where in, if the creationist worldview were nearly as monolithic as they would like to present to themselves the world. Um, but as soon as you start seeing the little details, you discover that there are schisms and disagreements galore. 
And so there's things about uh, how, when the flood was dated and material on which of these weird uh, soft tissue things are okay or not, and which of these supposed examples of human beings painting dinosaurs on their pictographs. Uh, some of them are accepting one and others will be uh, rejecting exactly the same one. Disputes about uh, the finding of Noah's Ark, you've got big schisms going on in that area. And then of course, technical issues uh, galore about um, um, the, the niche position that Randy Guliuza does at ICR where he's objecting to natural selection and, and everybody's starting to have to toe the line at ICR and the other creation is to go, what? They're basically jumping ship on it. Uh, and then, of course, another thing that's happening at ICR is the um, uh, uh, Tim Clary's bunch that are trying to put the flood boundary at uh, the Cenozoic instead of the uh, Cretaceous so that they can drag in all of those cute little fossil deposits like uh, all the uh, 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 not, um, uh, Green River uh, and other wonderful little fish deposits that are in the, the things that are that are too enticing to pass up if you're a creationist. But that means that and, and you can now can have the contiguous, but that means they're, they're chewing up more and more and more of things, by which time eventually they're getting down to the point where they're starting to bump into critters that human beings have interacted with and all that. Um, so it, it's a it's a funky little thing. Uh, to to do compile uh, listings of things to see what the heck is going on and also to doc put the documentation. Um, yes, they, they said they sometimes call context. Yeah, that um, that's the important thing that um, Jackson and I certainly are trying to illustrate in um, our scholarly work for these books. Um, each of us feeds off of each other's weaknesses and strengths. So I'm, I'm per currently going through and about a third of the way through uh, structuring um, the chapter that uh, Jackson's done on fossil transitions, which includes Tiktaalik and there's some material on the uh, um, obsessions about the Cambrian with uh, Steve Meyer and uh, then the, the supposed revolutions that are being caused by the Wistar conference and so forth and so on. There's a whole bunch of subject matter in there that's really neat. And I'm pulling in material that I'm aware of from my perspective because I'm an old fart who goes back much, much farther in time, whereas Jackson is a cutting edge biology student. So he's right at the edge of the current literature field. And I know I was in exactly the same mode when I was in college. I, I was in a historical framework, but anybody that, that had what you knew from high school level history courses. And then you suddenly start diving into the full picture of where the cutting edge scholarship is in relation to what's being talked about in college, whoop, you're into a different note. So between those two, we get to bounce back and forth. Uh, yes, they could. Oh, yes, indeed. There's a, 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 there's a specific point where we'll be cataloging the, the ones that grump about the, uh, the bathtub arc de depictions. Uh, some some of the people at ICR and um, uh, the like are just having conniption fits over that classic old style boat thing. And they regard it, uh, they don't want coloring books to be that mode. But then there's also disagreements about what the hell the bloody ark looks like. Uh, if you're in the answers in Genesis orbit, they're all running off of the ark encounter design with its big ship prow looking as like a big super tanker uh, format. Um, if you move outside of that to ICR and CMI, you're much more likely to be getting the big box crate uh, version, which started coming in in the, in the 1980s. And um, we'll be going into all the little scholarship on that kind of stuff to see how these little things have, have uh, flipped along. Plus the historic issues about where that um, Holiday Inn Express version of the ARC mode uh, started coming in all the way back in really in the 1600s uh, as people started to try to figure out, well, how can you put everything on the, are they thinking in terms of a conventional boat? Uh, <laughs> yes, what way do we do with morning math and listening to RJ? Exactly. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, it's either me or, or maybe both. Squeak, 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 uh, as the case may be. Uh, but um, so it's it's a lot of material that um, will be some of it will be familiar to people in some contexts. But I, do, I think as in the first book, uh, I think people will be surprised at some of the range of stuff as we suck all the material together to kind of bring it all up to date. Uh, that um, and then of course we're continuing to dive into the little weird nooks and crannies because when you were dealing with the Noah's Ark hunters bunch. You're sliding into the weird substratum 
of the creationist worldview. And these people will be sliding over also into that, um, oh, um, J Graham Hancock super civilizations and a little bit of like UFO lore and uh, uh, out of place weird objects, which that connects up to the Antikythera mechanism and the little Baghdad battery and all of this stuff that kind of floats around the edges of ancient astronaut lore. Well, down there at the basement, at, and we're talking, and by basement, we're talking below even Karl Ba level. Uh, this is the weirdest stuff that you pop up on the internet where there's a lot of incredulity going on and the new players on the scene coming in from Islamic creationism. And there's a little bit floating around in the corners of Hindu creationism that we'll be alluding to as well. So um, that's it, it's all going to be a lot of material. And I'm the one that is the uh, anal retentive geek for working out things for a complete master index that's that's comprehensive and make sure all the sources are properly and consistently cited and all the way through. And so Jackson doesn't have to worry about that end of it. He can write the material and lay out. He'll mention like the ch uh, a title of a paper and I'll worry about pinning down all the little niddly bits of the scholarship and stuff and cross-checking everything to make sure everything is as rigorous and, and meticulous as possible. So it's going to be a, um, a fun operation to see and hopefully we'll be nearing completion on that by the end of the year or into uh, 2025. We'll, we'll have to find out because it is, we want it to be just as, as um, delicious. I'll also have to make a point when I do the ebook version to avoid the glitch that happened on the other ones, because the info boxes that make perfect sense in terms of the page pagination modality on a PDF um, are not working for people in in the um, doodad format. So you you have the sections of that um, uh, info boxes are split apart in the text and mea culpa. Uh, that was my goof up. I hadn't realized what that might be doing in the thing. So I'll, I'll have to do two versions of the text. One explicitly for the PDF format that will be the one that is the print version. And then another one keeping all the info box material together as units inside the word processor document. That will be the one that will be the formation that's uh, sent on for the uh, ebook and that. And so um, we'll we'll get around that thing. Well, I'm new at this. I mean, I'm an old fart that dates from a time when manual typewriters were my very first thing I was clicking off of. And an electric typewriter was like, wow, how amazing. And and when the earliest handheld calculators were coming in and, and remote controls started showing up on TVs and VCRs, wow, and laser discs and all of the kinds of technologies and stuff that were just clipping along in there. Well, holy smokes, now we're in the era of uh, terabyte hard drives and uh, streaming video and all that, and and a plethora of science material and accessibility of so much that allows us to be meticulous in tracking down our source base on a scale that if we were trying to do this book 15 years ago, we couldn't have done it. And uh, so the fact that I'm diving into this material in the period after 2015 um, has been really useful in the accessibility and the tools that are available to really come up with with stuff that nails things down on a level that uh, is very, very satisfying. So anyway, uh, there we're a little bit past the half hour. Does anyone have any little questions for us uh, from the tub or from anywhere else? Um, if not, I will uh, go ahead and put up uh, our rocks with their very loud advert for volume one of the book. If you don't have it, why not get it? Give it as gifts. Donate copies to the library. Do the same thing with all of the books, including the Paralogs of Fog stuff. That uh, and I, I think you'll want the, the, the fiction, too. It's it's fun stuff. Anyway, let me get my little thing queued up for my... Um, come on. Why is that not opening? Come on. It was something uh, not balking as to how it was supposed to open, which was weird because I opened up the advert for uh, the the opening intro exactly the same way. So there's the foibles of the computer lab. Okie doke. Now let me um, put up my window, share our media player. Voila. And away we go.
And that reminds us, everyone. Uh, yeah, I learned an Emmanuel type. I was on my siblings and pool, their money to give mother. Yeah, the, the 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 range of the technological change that has happened within my lifetime, the range of scientific knowledge that has happened during my lifetime. Although I am an old fart, I wouldn't trade it for the world to uh, have to go back to the world of 1950s and 1960s uh, and the, the the difficulty of getting the kinds of information that I need. So. Uh, I couldn't have done uh, Evolution Slam Dunk if I hadn't have had all that material. I couldn't have written the Paralogues of Phileas Fogg if I didn't have the access to the historical information and the period photographs and the record keeping of stuff on such an enormous range of uh, material that would have been utterly inaccessible to somebody just trying to do on the fly uh, that kind of thing. So I have a lot of fun. Uh, working on all this, and I'm going to keep at it as long as possible. As long as we can keep the wooden penguins at bay, we will be on a safe thing. So everybody stay safe. If you're in places where there's some hideous blizzards that are happening or the fires in Texas and people dropping bombs in so many different places in the world, and oh, there's a lot of little murky things going on in, in that. And I want to live to a time when things will be less busy and people can be more interested in fulfilling their lives and being clever and developing all sorts of wonderful things and exploring the planets and making more and more information available instead of starving to death and being bombed on. That's the world that I'm wanting to see. So, um, oh, oh, yes. Well, you can plow ahead on it um, in it, uh, just um, um, as however long it takes uh, and uh, proceed accordingly. It can be a thing, you know, where you can just go a little few pages and uh, put a little bookmark in there and let it cogitate and work on those kinds of things. I'm very much a dialogue writer. Uh, I love character development through that. I love a certain droll wit. Uh, my niece is exceedingly fond of the chapter titles that I have these little double entendre chapter titles that, you know, you often find out what they mean very different than what you thought they meant after you get through the chapter, that sort of thing. Anyway, so 42 minutes, uh, we put up our adverts. Um, we'll, um, Settle all that one uh, probably in the next day or two. Then this will finalize and I'll put the linkages up on this. And then next week, hopefully, cross fingers, we will then be diving into the technical literature that they are going to be citing uh, and um, uh, find out what proportion of it. Not a great deal of creation of stuff that's going to be listed in this chapter. Uh, there, They actually are dropping a lot of technical citations. But is it recent? accurate material, older material? Are they being evasive on it? A big chunk of it is coming from a dinosaur encyclopedia from quite a few years ago. And so they're, they're kind of culling it from general uh, source material. So it's going to be funky to see what we'll, we'll see on that. So all of that will be in the weeks to come. Everybody uh, stay uh, safe, uh, avoid wooden penguins, and uh, we will see you all next week. Okie do.